Hey, welcome everybody. Let's talk real estate. Your weekly BS with Barry Saywitz about the current commercial real estate market here in Southern California. As we take a no BS look at both sides of the issues driving this market today to find the best solutions going forward. With our man right in the middle, Barry Saywitz. Hey, Barry. Hey, good morning, Paul, and good morning to all of our viewers and our listeners out there. It is Tuesday. We are back here again. I am Barry Saywitz, president of the Saywitz Company, managing partner of Saywitz Properties, and uh, we're going to talk some real estate again here today. I'm excited about today's show, but before we get going, I do want to do a couple of shout outs and plugs uh, if I can. So I, I want everyone out there to know and be aware that uh, I'm hosting a charity event for uh, to benefit and create awareness for autism, which is something that's near and dear uh, to my heart that we've done in the past. And it's called the Evening for Autism charity event. It's Saturday, November 2nd. It will be hosted at my home in Newport Beach, and it's to benefit Easter Seals, uh, which is uh, the largest provider of uh, services uh, and uh, treatments and, and um, uh, services to children and adults uh, suffering from autism in the country. And a lot of people don't know that. Their Southern California corporate headquarters is located right here in Orange County in Irvine. And so I'm excited to partner with them again. We've done this before. We expect 400 or more guests from all walks of life, politicians, athletes, celebrities, business leaders, community leaders, and people that care about and support autism. So I would encourage everybody out there to go to the website, which is evening for F O R autism socal.com you can buy tickets there you can uh find out more information about the event three live bands six or seven restaurants uh six libation beverage bars uh all kinds of fun stuff tropical theme party and uh check it out we'd love to see you there and if you're able to support whether that's by coming uh, or in any other capacity we will take your help and so now that I'm done pitching, uh, I want to turn our focus to today's show and I want to welcome our guest Salvador Lavinia from uh, Barnes and Thornburg Law Firm in Los Angeles. Sal, welcome to the show. Thank you, Barry. And uh, thank you for uh, your work in the community. It's yeah. good when successful folks are supporting uh, charitable causes. Always fun when you can combine a really cool fun party with doing something good for other people. And Great. so I'm happy to do it. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad you came on the show. You are the final segment in our legal aspects of commercial real estate. So I'm hoping we saved the best for last. That was the plan. No offense to the other guests. Uh, but we have talked about a lot of different sides and pieces to the legal aspects of commercial real estate since they sort of go hand Hand in hand and I know you're a partner with uh, with Barnes and Thornburg which is a big law firm in Los Angeles other offices as well and you have a real estate background and a legal background and I want to talk about that uh, a little bit and then we'll try and relate it to uh, what some of the folks out there are experiencing and, and dealing with on a daily basis so with all of that said I want to start with you went to UCLA you're a big supporter of UCLA, continue to support UCLA. And so that is why we saved you to the end because we've had other <laughs> folks from USC, no offense. <laughs> uh, but we are gonna give a plug and even though our football team might not be in the top 10, uh, we still like them and we still root for them and we still keep our fingers crossed and we will look forward to basketball season. Yes. So uh, I will say that uh, Barnes and Thornburg is a law firm with uh, 800 lawyers across the US. We have uh, 25 plus offices, but our main office is in Indianapolis. And so this was like Christmas for our partners from Indiana to come out to the Rose Bowl and watch their team uh, destroy the Bruins at the Rose Bowl. Yeah, we don't want to talk about that. We want to look forward. <laughs> we'll try and pick on the next one if we can. And so um, regardless, go Bruins, uh, whatever sport you're in, uh, we still think we're better than you, whoever else you are. <laughs> and so, uh, with that said, let's rewind a little bit. So, so you went to UCLA, right? And then uh, you decide to go to law school at Columbia. Um, not as good as UCLA, but still a very good school. What made you decide to want to get into the legal side of things and, and have that as a career? Was there always a plan to do that? Or was there a day you woke up and said, hey, maybe I'll try this? Well, it's an interesting story and a bit of a circuitous route. But here's the short part. So. I went to UCLA, it was some of the best years of my life. I started there taking classes in about 15 and a half. 
and uh, having my mom drive me to school there. Really? And, uh, and then I ended up attending on a full-time basis. When I graduated, my goal was to be a writer. I wanted to be like Ernest Hemingway or F. Scott Fitzgerald. So I did some newspaper jobs uh, in my high school and at college. And my first job out of UCLA was working for a paper called the Daily Journal. It's the law paper in uh, Los Angeles and in California. And uh, so I, I started there as an intern and I said, I will work for free. Have me do any job, I will sweep the floors. And if you decide after 90 days that you think I'm worthy of being uh, a reporter at the Daily Journal, then you can give me the spot. If not, then I will go and try somewhere else. So I worked my butt off. I did a lot of odd jobs at the paper. Some floor sweeping, I assume. Yes, yeah. that was one day. And then <laughs> I, one of the things I did for a while was proofreading the entire paper and then working in the advertising department and ultimately got to write articles. And so one day I was doing an article about how salaries for uh, new law school graduates were rising. And I interviewed a partner at Cravath, Swain and Moore. It's a big old line Wall Street firm in New York. And their salaries were going up to $100,000 a year for newly minted law students. And I wrote the article and then I thought, hmm, I could take the LSAT. I bet you I could get into some law schools. I had, I had already applied to get into some PhD programs and had gotten accepted, but decided not to go. So took the LSAT did okay, sent out some applications. And then I decided, well, Columbia is giving me a really good scholarship package. And uh, they really wanted to recruit kids from the West Coast. Yeah. And so I decided, eh, I'll go here, we'll see what happens. And uh, my first week there, I run into the only other kid there from California, and he was from USC. And I said, hey, Keith, how you doing? I said, what are you doing here? You're from USC. <laughs> but that's how I ended up there. And so uh, you go to law school there and then the weather's not so great. And so you come back to California yes, and sir. decide to be a lawyer and uh, work for other large law firms, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so how how did you get into the real estate segment of the, because the legal war, you, world, you can do a lot of different things. How did the real estate piece come about? You know, it's, uh, I think maybe developers trying to explain to their grandma why they do real estate might have a similar kind of story. Like I thought I would be a litigator and cause I enjoyed public speaking. I'd been on the speech and debate team uh, and I've done, you know, extemporaneous speaking and other things. But then, uh, you know, real estate, I would, ex I, you could look out the window. It's so tangible. You right, could you, see, it, you could touch it. Yes, you could see, look out the window and see a stadium or an office building or a, a retail center. It's like, you know, I did the negotiations for, I did the financing for that. I put together the JV equity for this piece and you can see it. And uh, when you see like entire communities being built as a result of your efforts, you didn't, a, a lawyer didn't do it by himself any more than a developer did it by himself. It's, right. it's a huge But you team. played a part in making a difference. Yes, and when they're successful, it's great. And when you're able to help somebody out of a difficult situation, that's great. When I'm able to help my investor clients figure out how to save on taxes and they're grateful, it's great. Yeah, which is similar to my story because my mother said to me, you should be a lawyer because you argue with me all the time. <laughs> I object. Yeah, <laughs> eat your vegetables. No, I'm not gonna do it. So, so you're in the real estate world in Los Angeles and then today uh, your role with uh, the firm that you're in, I, I, I guess uh, uh, congratulations are certainly due because you, you are, I was reading uh, and tell me if I got this right, but the first person of color within your firm to head a major department. Uh, and, and so um, I, I guess kudos for that. And then uh, you are a major player within the firm and dealing with some major transactions and some major folks in terms of not only here uh, in Southern California and Los Angeles in particular, but, but elsewhere around the country. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, recognition. Yeah, I would say, although I'm based in Los Angeles, I do deals, probably 80% of my deals are in other states. And we also work with international investors too. Um, it was quite an honor to be named to be the head of the real estate department for an 800 lawyer law firm, uh, along with the administrative burden. But part of it is it wasn't 
a pure DEI decision. It wasn't anything like that. It was about performance and about the ability to motivate people and about a determination of, does this guy really love what he's doing? And I really love what I do. And so that there's the technical excellence, there's the knowledge of the law, there's knowledge of accounting and tax, if other things, but if you really love what you do, it, it percolates and it spreads to other people. So the ability to motivate others to feel as enthusiastic about what we do, that's what uh, I think was part of the decision-making process. And I guess I'll ask the question because is the plan now that you're the head to grow the practice, to expand it, to bring in new talents and bring in other people in addition to, you know, doing what you keep doing all the time? Oh, yes, sir. You know, it's, it is a business. So uh, I tell people we're in the service business. Remember that we have clients and we provide service to help them be successful. We become successful if our clients are successful. Okay. It's not the other way around. And so um, I'm always thinking about growing and always thinking about getting great acquisitions. And it's not easy. Uh, especially, Certainly not in today's world. No. And, and I'm guessing you pay a little more than a hundred grand. Oh, uh, yes. In today's yes. world. I was looking at some of those numbers and it's not a bad place to be. So if folks out there, if you're thinking about going to law school or you have kids that are thinking about going to law school, not a bad gig. Yes. And um, it's funny, uh, like many of our clients, not many, but several of our clients may not even have finished college, but they do really well. And part of it, some people will say is, Many lawyers are thinking about all of the obstacles and all of the things in the way to achieving success that they can't achieve success at the same level. But it's a great steady job. You, if you work hard and do well and have good clients, you can make a really decent living. Yeah, and, and people always need lawyers for one thing yes. or another. I am a firsthand example of that one. I'm a walking lawyer magnet. <laughs> so, um, and, and in being in Los Angeles and being in real estate, you also have exposure to the entertainment industry. You have exposure to uh, the, the, the music industry and, and all the other things that go along with Los Angeles and Hollywood. And so you, you read about and you hear about uh, actors and uh, athletes getting into the real estate business, looking at alternative investments to take the money that they've made in their, their core uh, uh, profession and, and, and compound that in, into other things elsewhere. And you look at guys like Magic Johnson, uh, who have a huge real estate portfolio. And, and I know, you know, from conversations with him early on, that was really his goal was to become a businessman uh, and also give back to the community. And so I'm gathering that these people come to you and they're not, some of them are not real estate experts, right? Yes. And they have money and they're like, Hey, what do I do? They need help. They need planning, whether that's from a legal perspective, real estate perspective, accounting perspective. And so, uh, I'm going to ask the question. I think I know the answer, but from your firm's perspective and your practice and what you do, the firm is big enough to be able to handle multiple needs of these kinds of people. Absolutely. Now, on the one hand, we'll have, you know, family offices, and uh, individuals who've been in the real estate business since they were born, okay, and live and breathe real estate. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. We have a very active and vibrant entertainment department. We have a private wealth management department. And I've had the uh, blessing, the fortune, to represent a lot of well-known athletes and well-known musicians. Uh, I can't divulge too many uh, attorney-client privileges, but uh, I'll say on some of the on the athlete side, there was a time where we were probably representing. You know, if you looked at the starting all-star team a few years ago, we had half the people on the team. One of the sad ones was uh, we were doing the non-athlete work for Kobe Bryant, and I remember that weekend when his uh, yeah. helicopter crashed. But he's a smart guy. I mean, if it wasn't evident to everybody. He was getting involved in some interesting stuff. We've done a lot of interesting stuff for Russell Westbrook, who really gives back to the community. Yeah, and yeah. he's a UCLA guy. Right. Um, we have a number of uh, musicians and influencers and DJs who are clients. And it's great because you hear the stories about athletes who lost all of their money, you know, uh, many of my favorite athletes, you know. Yeah. But then on the other hand, you'll have a guy who was a bench warmer who's come up with a great idea and invested in it and all of a sudden he's doing really really well yeah. you know and so we've had the fortune to represent uh, lots of folks who decided early on it's a good idea to talk to a lawyer 
to talk to an accountant, to talk to a wealth advisor, a financial planner, instead of buying your mom and your whole entourage a house and a bunch of Ferraris. You know? Right, or gold fixtures or right. things that you just have no intrinsic value at the end of the day. And yeah. it's, a, it's like buying a boat or buying a piece of real estate. I picked the piece of real estate. Yes, right? exactly. So. And, you know, you got kids who are in their 20s with millions of dollars getting thrown at them. And, you know, what are you going to do? So. Yeah. So, and I say it all the time, every week on the show, right? It's important to get good advice. It's important to surround yourself with good people that can help you make smart decisions. Uh, the legal side and the real estate are connected. They're, they're, yeah, they're no different. So let's delve in. I want to talk a little bit about um, the 1031 exchange process, because I know that this comes up all the time when you start talking about preserving wealth, when you talk about trying to uh, minimize tax exposure in the real estate world. And for those folks that are not familiar with it, that are out there, the 1031 exchange, I'll, you'll give a better example, but it, it, it is an opportunity to sell a piece of property, trade it effectively and buy another piece of property for the same value or more money and trade up and get something bigger and not have to pay any tax on the sale versus if I just sold a piece of property that I bought and I make a million dollars, I will have to pay a good chunk of that to the government in taxes. And so I want to hear your sort of dumbed down uh, explanation of, of what it is, why it exists, and then how it comes into play in the real world. No, absolutely. And for many people, they'll say, oh, taxes, boring. Oh, you know, all this stuff, it's going to give me a headache. On the other hand, if you are not paying taxes or deferring taxes, and you're able to turn that into additional wealth, then it becomes very exciting. So, uh, you know, everyday people who are selling their houses can do this. And I have a lot of uh, clients, you know, who've been owning commercial real estate for decades, and you explain it to them, and the light bulb goes off and it's like, wow, this sounds great. So. The basic, the basics are, this has been in the law since probably the early 1900s. And way back then, the US decided it was good to have tax policy that encourages investment in real estate and large assets. So to give you an example at the simplest level, let's say you're a couple, you bought a duplex in the 70s for $100,000, and you're thinking about selling it and retiring. So today you're thinking about selling it and it's worth $10 million, right? If you sell it and you don't think about how to defer the taxes, and let's say you're doing well and between federal taxes and state taxes and everything else, you're in the you know 40 plus tax bracket. So all of that gain, the difference between 100,000 and 10 million, that 900, 9,900,000, it's taxable. Taxable at 40 plus percent. Right. Okay. So yes, you have a windfall of, uh, uh, you know, $4 million, which you can take. But, but you gave 5 million to the government or right. for another four or whatever right. it works out to be. Right. right. I'll, I'll give you a quick example of how I try to explain the effect of taxes and then I'll finish the 1031 stuff. I have, I'm blessed to have two great kids. Okay. And so, uh, if a piece of food is going by, like a piece of pizza or some ice cream, see like my daughter who's 10, uh, I'll say, hmm, and I'll take a big bite out of it. And she'll say, daddy, why did you do that? I said, it's called taxes. She's like, daddy, I hate taxes. <laughs> so to our example of the couple selling the duplex, so they're giving you know $5 million to the government in our example of a sale. Why do that when you could invest that money into something else and defer paying taxes? So the way it works is the 100000 that you use to purchase the property in the first place back in the 70s, that's called your basis. Right. Okay. And there can be adjustments to your basis, which we'll talk about in another episode. But the property has appreciated over the years. It's in a nice part of town. Uh, you've got good tenants. It's going to be desirable to somebody somewhere. Get to sell it for $10 million. Um, the base, the difference between the basis and the sale price is capital gains. Okay. So that $9 million is capital gains. Now that gets taxed at a more favorable rate. Okay. We're in the twenties right now. And there's some talk about increasing the capital gains rate, but if you can defer all of that by buying another piece of property, why wouldn't you do that? So you wouldn't pay any taxes, right? And so you would defer that 
entirely. And so you match the debt, you match the uh, capital gains, and you buy another piece of property. And you have 45 days to identify a replacement property. That's the new property you're going to buy. That's then, from the time that you close on the other property. Correct. And then you have 180 days from the time you close to close on the new property, the replacement property. You can take money off the table. Uh, some people forget that. That's called boot. Okay. But, and but you're paying tax on the boot. Absolutely. You're paying taxes on that. And so, you know, I have clients who have, they're called up legs from the sale of property and we'll recycle them as the next replacement property sells, they'll move that into another piece of property. And so they have legs going back to the seventies and eighties because they've been doing it so right, much. So you can keep trading this for generationally. You can yes. keep trading this throughout your entire lifetime. Right. And then you, again, I don't want to overcomplicate it for people who are not intimately familiar with it, but in your example, I made $9.9 .9 million and I don't want to pay tax on it. I don't have to buy one piece of property for That's $10 right. million. I could buy three or four pieces of property. Right. There's a number of rules. There's the three property rule where uh, you can trade into up to three other properties. Uh, there's a 200% rule. Uh, there's a few other complexities, but it's at the end of the day, we have flow charts that we've created to show and demonstrate uh, what you could do. So it's, it's and ultimately savvy not real estate people do this all the time, all the time. right? Real estate developers, they buy a property, they fill it up with tenants, they sell it for a bunch of money and they go on to the next deal. And they're most of the time avoiding the taxes and nobody's skirting it. This was set up by the government to encourage investment in real yes. estate, to encourage the economy to spur itself along. So it's not a bad thing that you're not paying the taxes. I assume everybody out there is greedy as much as the next person and doesn't want to pay the taxes, but uh, it is fueling the economy at the end of the day and it is causing transactions to happen. Absolutely. Let's talk about that because there's the process of the 1031. And, and I think what you're saying is the concept is I can avoid the taxes. I can trade into a different property, whether it's better or different or nicer or just I got something bigger and, and I didn't pay the taxes and I continue to build my wealth, whether that's for myself or, or future, uh, generations. future generations. Right. Th then, but at, at the same time, those 1031 transactions, a lot of times those people are also what fuels the market and, and what's going on uh, around. Because if, if I sold the property and I made a bunch of money and somebody paid me a stupid number that I thought was you know really ridiculous number and we rewind a couple of years, uh, the market was really hot, I might be inclined to not haggle so much on the next deal because I just don't want to pay the taxes and the tax savings to me is so much bigger than haggling with a guy for a small piece of the price. It, yes, and, and that's right. Um, and it definitely encourages investment and transaction volume. And lenders are used to this. They've all understood how it works. Um, it's great for brokers because a broker can help a client on the sale of a property and then the purchase of a replacement property. Right, so he gets two deals out of it if he can control the client. Right. And, and the original impetus for all of this was to encourage investment into commercial real estate infrastructure, real estate, like we talked about earlier, to have buildings around that are serving the community is really important, whether it's housing or retail or what have you. It is easier for somebody buying uh, a piece of property in, in a trade than it is to develop it from the ground up in almost every instance. And, yeah. and a lot of these people that are doing the 1031s, they have large amounts of cash because if you've owned the property for a longer period of time, you've built up more equity. So you're, right. if you needed a loan, it would be a smaller loan as opposed to a first time buyer that needs a large loan and has a small down payment. So as a seller of what I'll call the upleg properly property, uh, a 1031 buyer is a lot more better, a lot better of a buyer to me than a guy yes. who needs a loan, who needs time to close. He might get squirrely. The 1031 guy, he's got a timeline. He's got motivation. He is not going to nitpick as much because he doesn't care as much because he's not paying the taxes and he might have a bigger down payment. Well, yes. And, and when we're representing clients on the sell side, we'll often ask, is this buyer coming in uh, with a 1031 exchange? Because if you have a 30 day due diligence period and they've got 45 days to identify a property, guess what? Odds are good that you're going to do this deal. Right. You know, as compared to one of the things we've been seeing in the market is um, inexperienced buyers out there. So they'll 
make an offer to buy a you know twenty million dollar apartment building, and they haven't been through the Fannie Freddie process. They're syndicating the dollars up to the last minute, and then more and more things happen. And then and they, they tie up your property string, yeah. And then maybe they can't close or they need more time. And they lose their deposits. We've had that happen more in the last 12 months than I've seen in the previous 12 years. Yeah, I, and I believe it. Yeah, whereas 1031 buyers, they've got the cash. Uh, they usually have the financing ready to go and they have to replace the financing. And they can't blow the deal because then they have to pay the taxes if right. they run out of time. Right. Which is why you see a lot of times in the real estate world, people get down to the end of their 45 day process and they're in a dead panic. Yes. And then it's not even about haggling on the price. <laughs> it's about just find me something so I don't have to pay the taxes. Yes. And, and so arguing about $100,000 on a purchase price versus paying $4 million in taxes are just apples and oranges. Yes. And to be clear, I'm not providing legal advice. So consult with your independent tax advisors. But one of the things about this process is planning. You've got to plan, uh, what do they say? Fail to plan, plan to fail, okay? And so you should be thinking about your replacement properties already and have some scoped out. And sometimes you'll be able to do advanced due diligence depending on the brokers and who you're dealing with so that once you've picked it and you have your 45 day period starting, you already have you know a number of properties that you're considering. Yeah. You may have, may have done some of the due diligence already. And in today's world, uh, it is certainly more difficult to make a deal. And the volume of 1031 exchanges that are out there is less than before yes. because there's just less transaction volume in the first place. And so some people might say, hey, look, maybe I'm not going to get my price. Maybe now is not a good time to sell. And so there's less stuff to pick from. Yeah. And, that, and that's a fact. Uh, and many people... There's actual data, and then we call it anic data, okay, when somebody has anecdotes that aren't supported by actual data. But actual data, transaction volume has dropped significantly from the heights, I think it was in 2022. And uh, I brought a chart, uh, I won't pull it out, but from Green Street, that's one of my go-to yeah. sources for data and reporting. And if you look at the chart, you know, yeah, 2022 and then the drop through 2023 and then the spikes in interest rates. But the good news, the good news for everybody is that uh, transaction, transaction volume is picking up as of uh, Q2 of this year. Uh, lenders are lending, interest rates are dropping, refis are happening. Not, you know, obviously not to the level that we were in 2022, but there are some uh, bright signs on the horizon. Yeah, and so I want to ask you about that, I guess, in a general sense, we'll come back to the, the nuances of the 1031 uh, in a second. But in terms of where we are uh, with interest rates, right, everybody's expectation is that interest rates will continue to drop uh, between now and the first quarter of next year, regardless of the end result of the election, uh, and, and that that will spur more activity. And, and I find that the perception of interest rates are down, things are better. The average person says, yeah, interest rates are down, things are better. I'm not sure how that relates back to a commercial real estate loan. I feel like the banks have already priced in whatever adjustments the Fed might make, but it will ease uh, the ability to get a loan and, and banks want to make loans. And so it will help, I think, in a general sense. I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, and um, there's no direct cause and effect. I agree with you on that. However, um, I do believe that a lot of the macroeconomic factors are interrelated, inextricably intertwined. So uh, for consumer financing, for residential loans, I think there'll be a more immediate impact. So if the Fed drops interest rates by 50 basis points tomorrow, you'll see a corresponding drop in 30-year mortgages, Right. You know, hopefully within a couple of weeks, okay? That will probably have some uh, effect of enthusiasm among potential home buyers, all the people who've been waiting and waiting and waiting, which will lead to you know increased spending, consumer confidence, stock market you know, uh, purchasing, and I think it has an effect on co commercial real estate as well. I, I do too. I couldn't agree more. I also feel like if interest rates do come down on short-term rates, then somebody who says, well, look, I'm just leaving my money in the bank and I'm getting five or five and a quarter percent today. And that all of a sudden becomes four or four and right. a quarter. It becomes more attractive to buy a piece of real estate. Whereas today it's, it's not that attractive because right. I can't get that return in a piece of real estate. So I might as well just let it sit. Absolutely. No, that, and that's right. Uh, you, you know, a lot of real estate guys will 
put less stock in the stock market and other macro uh, economic factors, but I do feel like they're intertwined. Yeah, and I, so, I agree. So consumer confidence helps residential real estate, ultimately helps commercial real estate. People want to buy stuff, they're going to go to the mall, you know, and retail is going to uh, increase. People want to buy stuff and they'll order from Amazon. So, or all the other uh, uh, online retailers. And so that helps the industrial and other processing sectors. Well, and I also want to talk about, because there is sort of a new nuance to the 1031, which is that if I owned my house and I lived in it for 30 years and I want to downsize or I want to go do something different and my house obviously has gone up in value, the 1031 historically has not uh, applied to your house. You can't do it on your house, right? Yes. It has to be an investment piece of property. And for those again out there that, I mean, it used to be if I owned a, an apartment building, I had to buy another apartment building. If I owned an office building, I had to buy another office building, which became very restrictive because you better be committed to that segment of the market. And then when they changed it and said, you could buy whatever you want within reason, you just can't live in it and have it be your house. Then uh, it opened things up, but now there's a new twist on it. And I want you to expand on it because if I own my own house and it went up in value and I want to sell it, I cannot sell it as my house. But what I could do is I could move out and I could rent my house for six months or a year. And all of the sudden now it becomes investment property and I can go rent a condo or I can go travel or I can go live with my mother-in-law or whatever you want to do. And you've converted now your house to investment property that is now eligible for the 1031. I want you to talk about that. So, uh, uh, as I said earlier, this is not legal advice and please talk to your uh, tax advisors of your own choosing, but you are absolutely right, Barry. So, um, there is the uh, 55 and up rollover, but that's not a big amount of money, especially considering the value of houses in Orange County and Los Angeles County. But what you're talking about is exactly right. So. Um, if you rent out your uh, residence for a certain time period, uh, yes, that's it's not a loophole. People say, oh, the loopholes in the tax law. I say, no, this is this is real. Right in the code, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And there's even, uh, I believe on the IRS page, they have the timelines and the guidelines for how to do this. And you could talk to your lawyer or your accountant to help you do that. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm not giving advice either to anybody, but hypothetically, you could move out of your house, rent it for a year, sell your house, take the profit from the house that you've lived in for however long you've been there, and go buy an apartment building or an office building or a shopping center and not pay any taxes from it. Absolutely. Uh, well, defer the taxes. And then if you do planning, you could ultimately not pay the taxes. Right. But uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm planning to do that with my house. And I have a number of friends and clients who've asked about that. And they might have multiple residences. And this applies, it seems to me like it would apply to a lot. I mean, I have a couple of friends that live in Los Angeles and they said, Hey, I'm going to sort of quasi retire, slow down. I'm going to buy a place in the desert or, you know, for people in the Midwest uh, who like to go to Florida and retire, you would do the same kind oh, of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And uh, some people will have more than one house and they'll, they'll put one of the properties on an Airbnb and they'll rent it out, uh, not consecutive weeks, but several different weeks during the year. And they'll reach the minimum time period to call it a rental property yeah. and not their primary residence. Yeah. And, and so it's a new one. I, th I see a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon with it. Uh, and I think it's a real thing going forward for, yes. for many people. Just uh, be careful with your lenders because some guys will have six houses and claim them as their personal residence. Right. And, and you can't do that. Right. The lenders won't necessarily check if you're paying your mortgage payment every month. So just uh, traps for the unwary. So just uh, be careful. But it, a lot of people are doing it and it makes sense and it's in the tax code. So this isn't some exotic loophole. And, and don't you find too that a lot of the older investors uh, or people who are just sick of dealing with the headache of managing their property or all the drama that goes with it, or you talk about certainly here in Southern California and Los Angeles in particular, a lot of uh, restrictions, uh, environmental restrictions, governmental restrictions, rent control restrictions, eviction restrictions, really makes it difficult to be a landlord in a lot of different places. And then they do the 1031 exchange and they will trade into what we, you and I would call the single tenant triple net leased investment, where I trade a, an apartment building that might have 20 or 30 tenants for one building that might be a Walgreens or a Rite Aid or a Starbucks. And I have one tenant who has good credit, who sends me a check every month, and then I can go do what I need to do. And I don't have to worry about the money coming in. No, absolutely. Um, one of the uh, 
fundamental principles of a 1031 exchange. It's called a like-kind exchange. So if you have a piece of real estate, you have to trade into another piece of real estate. Now, that doesn't mean apartment building into apartment building. You could sell an apartment building and trade into a piece of raw land, or you could trade into a ground lease, or you could trade into a retail building or a house. Right, rent. but you can't buy a new car with it. Right. You can't buy personal property. There's real property and there's personal property. Not to digress, but you used to be able to do uh, personal property. And so people were doing trades in exotic cars or pieces of or fine boat art. Or, or boats. Art. Right, sure. Or jewelry. Or coins. Or, right. Yeah. But that, that was changed a few years ago. Okay. So back to the like kind of change, it has to be another piece of real estate. And there's some exceptions. So uh, we have clients, some of our smartest clients, uh, a couple of family offices, get out of multifamily and would trade into triple net leases, Walgreens, uh, uh, what's it called? 99 dollar. cent store, dollar, yeah. dollar general, yeah. right? Uh, Which are solid investments and much less management intensive. Now don't trade into a blockbuster or, uh, something or even like 99 cent is now gone, but, right. but a dollar general, it's solid or a Walgreens yeah. or, or something like that. One of the things that's happened that I've noticed, and again, this is an anecdata, we haven't seen any formal uh, research on this, but the perception is that the quality of property management for multifamily properties, especially for companies that have pretty large portfolios, the, the quality has gone significantly down. A lot of the big players like Graystar has gotten more into investing. Uh, a lot of the regional ones, they're paying the lowest common denominator and it's hard to keep and retain good property management personnel. And so we've had clients with significant issues with uh, some of the property management companies. And they would also, your typical uh, uh, entrepreneur is gonna take the best property managers and hire them for themselves. Yeah, well, you combine that with increased operating expenses, you combine that with uh, frivolous litigation, you combine that with COVID where people thought that it was okay not to pay their rent, and then you've just got a horrible scene, and then you should come over to my office and we're dealing with all that stuff all the time. And paying more, yes. And so, so a lot of, uh, several of our clients are getting into self-management. So that's the older school version. I find that a lot of the companies have been around for more than a few decades have always done self-management or they even came from property management into property ownership. But then I have clients that are, you know, fund level or larger, and they've always had third party management, but because of the inconsistent quality of a lot of property management companies, there's more of a trend towards self-management and keeping it all vertically integrated within your own company. And I find as people get older, they just get sick of dealing with it. Yes. And I've retired a lot of people and I've bought their apartment buildings. And what did they do? They bought a Walgreens uh, yes. and they coupon clip because they're like, I want to go play golf or I want to go play cards or go to the beach. And I don't want to have to wonder if my tenant paid me rent or if somebody broke a window or a pipe leaked or whatever right. the case was. Or, or if my property manager did something bad to a tenant or they have a labor law claim, you know. You and, name it. Absolutely. And so part of the science you know i said earlier one of the rules is be prepared plan to do what you're going to do look at the different types of investments that would be available for you to trade into for a replacement property now some people don't want to buy and hold they want to think about the fastest exit and so people have looked into upreits or dsts or um, oil and gas leases or other types of investments Make sure you do your diligence because there's some out there that are great and you might have relatively quick liquidity. Others are not so much. Uh, another idea that some people have done is you'll find an experienced sponsor. You'll find a company that owns a lot of multifamily properties or triple net properties and they have a good track record. You ask them about the track record, you look at their uh, offering documents, you check out uh, their background and you can co-invest with them in what's called a tenancy in common. And so you could have, uh, you know, a sponsor tenant in common and your tenant in common. And, and you're owning a do. piece of a much bigger right. property, but somebody else still deals with the headache, not you. Right. And truly coupon clipping. Right. Uh, but Just got to hope that the guy who's running the show knows yes. what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing, you know, uh, some people use their lawyers for everything. Some people don't use lawyers, but one thing that's a good idea is to help on your due diligence and your planning. When you talk about the guy who's trying to get, you know, the, the, the flipping, while that's not so prevalent in today's environment because of just where the economy is, 
But the guy who buys a property uh, and then fixes it up and flips it and makes some money, whether that's a rental house or whether that's a small apartment building, and I start with two units and then I try and buy four or eight. The 1031 is absolutely perfect. That is the vehicle that allows somebody to continue to build wealth and while it also allows somebody that's trying to get out and minimize their exposure and their headache. So, I mean, I, you know, the, the thing makes sense. It's out there. I don't know how else to describe it. You talk to your attorney, talk to your real estate broker, uh, and, uh, and those are the people that will guide you through the process. Yes. So. Uh, there's, there's lots of permutations, but I hope I've explained the basic yeah. structure. Uh, we could go all day, but we don't have all day. And so I do appreciate you walking Absolutely. us through – uh, that in terms of if people want to find out more information about your firm or about you, what's the website that they can go to? So you can check out our law firm's website. It's btlaw.com. That's Barnes Thornburg Law.com. And then me, I'm SPL at BT Law. So it's easy to find. Um, and we have offices across the U.S. So uh, if you're looking at a deal in Indiana or Georgia or Pennsylvania, we can help you out. Yeah, good. Well, listen, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your insights with us uh, and uh, much continued success to you and the firm and your family. Uh, And we'll look forward to having you back. I think as we see the economy unfold going forward, we've been doing this show long enough where it was all roses when we started and then it tanked. And then now we're trying to, you know, uh, keep our fingers crossed for the future. We'll have you come back and we'll reanalyze it and see what you think then. Lots of opportunity out there. So. For sure. So, Sal, I appreciate it. Uh, For those of you uh, tuning in, listening in, uh, I appreciate it again as well. Uh, We will be back here next week. I am Barry Saywitz, uh, president of the Saywitz Company. Thanks for tuning in to Let's Talk Real Estate. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Barry. Well, there you have it. You've been listening to Let's Talk Real Estate, your weekly BS with Barry Saywitz about the current state of the real commercial real estate market right here in Southern California. On Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio, streaming live from our studio here at the University of California Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center.